and welcome to day four of Blackathon. So it is already 3.30. I woke up at 9.30 a.m. all excited and ready to start a full day of reading. I had slept really well, I was in a fantastic mood, and just as I was getting dressed, I received a knock at the door. I walk to the front door, fling it open, and standing before me is a police officer. And my first thought is that I'm about to get arrested. Immediately my brain went to a hundred places and I just was like, oh my god, what have I done wrong? And he hands me a piece of paper and tells me that I am being sued. Around 2011, 2012, I purchased a piece of jewelry from a jewelry shop on a whim and it was one of the most irresponsible things that I've ever done. I was pretty young and definitely didn't have the money financially to keep up with the payments for this piece of jewelry. I've been incredibly irresponsible with money and paying my bills for several years and it is completely as a result of having severe anxiety. And because of my anxiety, which was incredibly bad and at its height around 2011 to 2013, 2014, pretty much any time during that time period when I received a bill, I would ignore it. I didn't have the capacity or the discipline to be able to sit down, look at my bills, talk to a financial advisor, or to face the idea that I had to pay somebody else money. Essentially, I would just get so overwhelmed by the concept of having to pay my bills that I just wouldn't pay them at all. I would tell myself that I would pay them next month or that I had other things that were more important and I would just put them on the back burner, throw them away, and think that they would somehow vanish as a result of me putting them into the garbage. So over the last two years, I have slowly been digging myself out of this awful hole of debt that I have gotten myself into. My debt currently is now at around four or $5,000, which is much better than where it actually was. And it has felt so good to get my life financially on track. I'm now following a very strict budget. I track all of my money. I'm incredibly responsible with how I pay my bills, when I pay them, etc. So long story short, I have one major bill that I have to pay off. And I've been taking way too long to pay off that bill, so long that the company decided to sue me for damages. The most ironic thing about this is that now that my financial life is finally under control, I was about two weeks to maybe even a week away from paying this bill off. So I find it very ironic that they chose this moment to sue me. Long story short, I ended up talking with the company and I made a payment of like $600 to them today and I owe them even more money in about a couple of weeks, but after I make that payment, the bill will be completely gone. And I bring all of this up just because I wanna be very transparent about how my struggles with anxiety have severely impaired my ability to deal with the financial responsibility of being an adult living on your own. And I wanna just make sure that you know that if you are in or have been in a similar situation, it's absolutely okay. I personally am glad that I made my financial mistakes when I was around 18 years old because now I've set myself up in the future for success. I know what not to do and I know the consequences of procrastinating. I definitely use procrastination as a way to escape my anxiety. I figured that if I put off thinking or even looking at bills or financial responsibilities or any kind of responsibilities that they would just somehow vanish. Procrastination has been a very negative coping mechanism that I have relied heavily on for many, many years and I'm so proud of myself for finally kicking that habit, although I do still struggle with it from time to time. And that is a big part of the reason why I got my academic planner and why I write down literally everything about myself. It's so important for me to write down my habits on paper so that I can look back at them and track my own progress, whether that's emotional health, physical health, mental health, financial health. So I don't know if any of you watched that video where I talked about my planner and how I customized it, but in the planner I had developed a mission statement for 2019 and that statement was do not idle, conquer. And I chose that mission statement because I have done so much idling throughout the last nine or eight years and I don't wanna do that anymore. I don't want to wait and put things off because I'm too afraid to look at them. So that took up a great portion of my morning. And then I also had other adult things that I had to do. I spent about three hours filing my taxes. Now I have to go to the post office, go to the fax store, and also go to the grocery store because I am making chicken eggplant parmesan for dinner. 
So I'm gonna do all of that and then come back home and prep my meal for dinner. But I wanted to show you guys what I'm gonna be reading in this vlog today. The first book I will be reading is the group book for Blackathon, The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. I am going to be buddy reading this with Nisha from On the Margins Of. I'm also gonna be reading the sequel to The Bells, The Everlasting Rose. I am so excited to start this because I personally loved The Bells. I know it was a very polarizing book for many of the bookish community. And I'm not saying that it was was the Mona Lisa of literature, but it was just so enjoyable and well-crafted, constructed, and I just absolutely loved the components of decadence and the political social elements. And then I'm also going to be starting the fifth season by N.K. Jemisin. Okay, so I have my defrosted chicken breasts and I'm going to trim them for the fat and then marinate them in olive oil and add herbs of slits into the meat so that the olive oil can permeate the flesh of the chicken. And that way the herbs can sink into the deeper layers of the chicken as well. Sanitized everything, including the cutting board, and then now have prepped the chicken breast as well. So they're just gonna go off to the side. Next is to prepare the eggplant. Eggplant is really dense, and in order to caramelize it in the oven, you have to make sure that you put an adequate amount of olive oil on it. So I'm basically gonna treat this the same way I treated the chicken. I'm going to sufficiently coat it with oil and seasonings, and then we'll be putting it on this tray for cooking. Hey y'all, it's pretty late at night and I read about 100 pages into the fifth season. It's a very difficult book to get into, but so many of you have been excited for me to read it and think that I'm gonna love it. It certainly has the potential for me to fall in love with it. I did not get to start The Everlasting Rose by Don L. Clayton, which is the sequel to The Bells, but I did start and complete The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo. I thought this book would simply be about an Afro-Latin girl suffering under the impossible standards of her Catholic mother and finding an outlet through spoken word and the book is certainly about that but it's also about so much more okay I had to sit down because I'm out of shape and I got tired of standing and holding the book <laughs> so much about this book feels as if it was written just for me and I'm not used to that feeling because Ziomara and I are both Afro Latinx and grew up in New York City I share a kinship with this character that I wasn't anticipating I wasn't expecting the book to so adequately summarize what it's like to live in inner New York City. Elizabeth Acevedo got it down to the letter, what it's like to have hot summers in New York and to spend all of your time sitting out on the stoop, socializing with those in your neighborhood. All of the politics that go along with being in the barrio, everything was perfect when it came to establishing the nuance and the specificity of life in Harlem. Because of all of those things, this book felt like I was reliving my childhood. And that was a very special thing that I wasn't ready for. The book talks a lot about how Afro-Latinx parents teach girls in particular that their bodies are impure and that they shouldn't have any sort of sexual desires. And it also shows the disparity between how Afro-Latin parents treat their girls versus their boys. Sons are worshipped in Latinx households and girls are merely whipped. Her brother isn't held to the same sexual standard that she is. Her brother has nowhere near the amount of crippling expectations that her mother has for her simply because she is a young woman. This was something I related to heavily because it always drove me nuts that my mother, who is Latin, always insisted that my brother could stay out as late as he wanted and my brother had all of these privileges even though I had much better grades and was never in trouble like he was. But because of my status as a girl, I was not allowed anywhere near even a modicum of the amount of freedom that he was inherently given. And while this is not specific to Afro-Latinx cultures, it certainly runs rampant within it. 
it. But I'm also fascinated by Zia Mata because we differ in the fact that she has no problem standing up for herself. Because she is tall and very curvy, she has large breasts and a large butt. Boys have been sexually assaulting and sexually harassing her in school since she was about 11 years old. And because of this, she is completely sick of it and has no problem putting her hands and fighting boys in the hallways. This is something that I admire so much because I I could never really find it within myself to stand up to people who were bullying me when I was a kid. Literally the one time that I hit a bully back, I was completely riddled with guilt even though I definitely got the desired outcome and she never touched me again. But even to this day, like 10 years later, I still feel nothing but remorse over having laid my hands on a girl. Even though this was a girl who was constantly attacking me physically and emotionally for no reason. So I think it's really beautiful to be given an Afro-Latinx character who has no problem standing up for herself, especially because men, teachers, even the girls around her consistently fail to come to her rescue. She experiences little to no solidarity. And I related to that as well because we have this strange assumption that black and Latin girls don't need to be stood up for, that they can take care of themselves because we come from hard cultures. We're never treated as soft, gentle, shy human beings that need to be protected the same way that our white female counterparts do. And I think because of how shy and unwilling to stand up for myself I was as a child, I'm now completely fascinated with female characters who fight. My favorite female characters of all time I've noticed are all very skilled at combat or martial arts or are very capable superheroes. I loved the part of the book where Ziyamata finally discovers spoken word and finds that she has a miraculous capacity for it. Ziyamata discovers her own superpower and I don't think it's a coincidence that Elizabeth Acevedo chose her superpower to be spoken word because spoken word has been an outlet for Afro-Latinx people for literally centuries. Because Afro-Latinx people have been given so little power historically, all that we really have had throughout the centuries are our words. Our words have been how we have been able to get people to see our perspective, to hear and understand our suffering, and more importantly, for us to heal through our own suffering and to bond and relate to one another. I never ever feel more connected to my blackness or my Latinxness than when I am listening to spoken word, especially if it's spoken word that is coming from somebody from either of those cultures. I also wanna add that the New Yorkian Poets Cafe was mentioned in this book. This is where Ziomata performs and just seeing the, the name of that cafe got me very emotional because this is a cafe that I have been to many times myself. It's one that I always try to visit whenever I'm in New York and it has a very long history of giving brown and black people voices to finally speak and be heard. So to see that referenced and reflected in this story about a young Afro-Latinx girl who was coming of age and finding her own voice was so invaluable. I also just really love the romance that Ziomata has with one of her classmates. He was so sweet and respectable and he treated her the way that she deserved to be treated. It was so beautiful to watch her fall in like with this boy and to have a relationship that was constructive because she is surrounded by so much destruction in this novel. The verses throughout this book painted such a complete picture of Ziomata's life. I was worried going into this book that it would kind of feel like snapshots since this book is told completely in verse, but it did not at all. It felt so cohesive and it was just perfect. And I loved the feminism in it. This is a book that I think every young girl or gender non-conforming person needs to read. It was honestly so beautiful seeing Ziomata's family partake in customs and traditions that my family partake in. And without Blackathon, I don't think I ever would have picked up this book. I don't think I ever would have engaged with this narrative. And I'm devastated to think about how books by people of color and books that talk about things where people of color are the center tend to get put on the back shelf. And I think that sometimes we get an idea that if a character of a novel is of a different culture than us, then there certainly couldn't possibly be anything in that book for us to relate to because we're too different from each other. And that's so not true. Before I go to bed, I wanna turn the video over to Olivia from Olivia's Catastrophe because she is going to be our fourth featured booktuber for Blackathon. Her channel has so much energy and exuberance and there is something so charismatic about it. She also has some amazing discussions happening on it. The last one that I saw talked about explicit sex scenes in young adult fiction and questioned whether or not teens are able to engage with such a traumatic topic and whether or not they should. She cares so much 
much about having informed discussions and conversations and it truly shows on her channel. I will see you tomorrow for day five and here is Olivia. Hey guys, I'm Olivia from Olivia's Catastrophe and thank you so much to Jessie for having me on their channel. Give me a couple of questions and I'm here to answer them. The first one is what is my favourite type of genre or book to read and any and all. Like honestly, I stick to no genre, I really can't. I've probably read every single genre, the only one I haven't read is true crime yet and I'm gonna get there. I'm gonna get there guys. Then Jessie asked for a book trope that I love and I've got two that I'm gonna quickly mention. The first one is the fake dating trope. I am always down for that in my romance books and then the other one is a friendship. Give me a good friendship any day and I am absolutely here for it. Then they asked if I would marry any book character, which one would it be? If you know me, you know I recently fell in love with The Raven Cycle and Adam Parrish is completely my bae and I would just marry him in a heartbeat. He is... He's the ultimate bae. And the last question is to mention a favourite book at the moment and in the spirit of Blackathon I'm going to choose Thoughts and Crosses by Mallory Blackman. So this one is about racism and discrimination but she has reversed it in this book. So the black people are the ones with the privilege and the white people are the ones who are oppressed. There's a forbidden romance between a biracial couple and a lot of family drama, a bit of politics and things go down. It was the first time I saw myself reflected as a black woman in a book that I read when I was 12 and that's why this one is a favourite of mine. It's very like close to my heart. The author is amazing, she talks really well on the subject of racism and the ending ripped my heart into shreds. Thank you so much once again to Jessie for having me. Goodbye!